Welcome to Puro Politics, the political podcast of the San Antonio Express News. My name is Gilbert Garcia, Metro columnist, and I'm joined by City Hall reporter Joshua Fector, business editor and columnist Greg Jefferson, investigative reporter Brian Chasnoff. And uh, we've been talking about this uh, for the last couple of weeks, but I think it's it's pretty clear that the big issue uh, in San Antonio politics in 2021 will be the issue of police reform. Um, we obviously have uh, city council elections this year, and I think it's an issue that everyone running for city council has to address. And there's also the the possibility that we could have uh, um, a, a ballot initiative that uh, that the voters are going to have to to uh, decide on when it comes to how we're going to go forward with police negotiations. And uh, we've, we've been talking about it amongst ourselves, but today we actually have people who know what they're talking about. Um, we've got uh, a couple of people who are with the organization Fix SAPD, which has, uh, which formed last year and uh, has launched uh, a petition drive to repeal both Chapter 174, which is of the Texas Local Government Code, which uh, is, uh, creates a, sort of a collective bargaining system and chapter 143 which is sort of a civil service uh, framework for for uh, local communities around uh, the state so today we are joined uh by uh ej pinnock and james dykeman with fix sapd and we're looking forward to talking with them thank you so much for joining us thank you i wanted to start off before we get into some of the you know the, the substance of, of what you all are trying to do just to talk a little bit about um, where things stand now. Now, the my understanding is that you all submitted uh, a petition or the signatures for your petition drive on Chapter 174 for collective bargaining, and the the threshold there to get that on the ballot is twenty thousand valid signatures, and um, Chapter 143 is, is just a much heavier lift. It's a, close to eighty thousand. Where do things stand now? Have you, have you all heard anything from from the city clerk about because um, they have to sort of uh, check the signatures to make sure enough of them are valid? Have you heard anything on that front? And where do things stand with the the petition drive for Chapter One Forty Three? Okay, uh, here uh, I'll go ahead and answer that. This is EJ. Uh, so, like you said, like you stated, we've turned the signatures in for One Seventy Four. We have not heard back from the city clerk. Uh, which is actually good news. Uh, we're told <laughs> if you hear from us early, it's not because you know we're throwing you a party. Uh, it usually be- means that you've fallen short. So uh, we will know by, I believe, the deadline she has to put it on the agenda will be next Monday. Uh, so by next Monday, we'll all be able to you know know for sure whether or not we're going to be on there. We believe we turned in enough signatures uh, from the validation that we did, we believe we have enough signatures to put 174 on the ballot in May. Mm -hmm. And as far as 143, we're still going forward collecting signatures for that. Uh, Like you stated earlier, it's, it requires four times the amount of signatures. So we knew it was going to take a bit longer, Uh, but we didn't want to hold anything up at 174. We wanted to get that process started right away. Is, is it your, your, uh, hope to get the 143 what, what, what's your expectation for when that uh could go before voters i you know if, if everything wins as, as well as as you all hope it does um uh, right now we're not setting a a deadline on it it's something we're working towards if we get it done uh by in time for the november ballot that's something we could look at if we get it done in time for the next may ballot that's something we could look at also I, I want to get a sense from you all, you know, the, the, we've heard a lot of talk about collective bargaining and, and, uh, the, you know, the, the pluses and minuses with that, that process. And I think, uh, I, I, my sense is that, that a lot of the people who are, uh, including uh, you all who are frustrated with collective bargaining have the sense that, um, for one thing that, the, that the, the police union in San Antonio has just been, um, really unwilling to compromise when it comes to disciplinary measures, but also just that the process of collective bargaining itself gives them too much leverage. Um, is that, is that the way you see it? Is that, is that one of the things that's kind of driving this, this uh, petition, uh, drive that you all have been doing? Yeah, uh, that's definitely one of the issues we have. We feel the current negotiation process, uh, is far too tilted in the favor of SOPOA. Uh, not even their 
day-to-day members, but Sapoa leadership. And James, if you want to hop in here, I don't want to <laughs> hog up the mic, uh, but uh, I can go on for days on this. <laughs> yeah, can can you give, can you give us a better idea of what you mean by stilt? You know, kind of tilted. tilted yeah. yeah, yeah, tilted in in Sapoa's direction. Take, Why do you think that is? Yeah, so take for take for instance the evergreen clause, right? Mm-hmm. So you have an eight-year evergreen clause, right? What that means is that there is essentially, let's say you have a city council member who really thinks that police reform is something that needs to be dealt with now and needs to be dealt with right away. Mm-hmm. Because of that eight year evergreen clause, so people can just look at them and say, okay, we'll wait you out. Right. So mm-hmm. you saw this with Ray Saldana. He was a staunch supporter uh, in terms of police reform. But ultimately, the last uh, contract took several years. And all, all, Mayor Ivy Taylor simply wanted to strike a deal because elections were coming up. That evergreen clause that spans over multiple elections mm-hmm. puts city officials at a disadvantage because they have to go to the voters. And each time they go to the voters, they have to fight, you know, the unions. They have to fight the union's coffers in terms of spending, in terms of uh, political spending. And basically, they're. They're negotiating with one arm tied behind their back. Uh, the union could always just wait them out. And that's mm. that to, to us is probably one of the biggest issues we have with this contract. We've got several. As you know, we have a, a long list. But when I talk about an unbalanced negotiation process, that's really one of the major key aspects that people really need to understand. Sapoa has crafted previous contracts in a way that gives them advantages at the negotiation table. So we're trying to change that up. So this is this is. I'm, I'm sorry. This is the first time I'm, I'm hearing y'all uh, talk about other aspects of the contract than uh, the disciplinary aspect. So is this is this larger than? Is this now a larger? Uh, you know, reckoning with the contract that y'all are are trying to force outside of the disciplinary aspects. Well, kind of, this is James here, and, and kind of the the focus that we found is, you know, with the contract, we find that there are about 10 issues with the contract. You know, there are the disciplinary issues, and that's kind of our main focus, right? Um, you have the issues that are obviously in 143, civil service protections. Um, we can obviously talk about that as well. Um, that's like arbitrators. Um, that's the mm-hmm. access to evidence. That's investigations. Um, but also, you see provisions that have been expanded, right? So, the issue with what has happened so far over the last 50 years under this law is that you've seen an expansion of privileges in this disciplinary process, right? The city pays for officers that come back through misconduct. Um, the city has to provide them more access to evidence than was um, laid out in 143. Um, it allows you to get rid of records after a certain period of time, depending mm-hmm. on what kind of you know infraction it was or misconduct or discipline. So really, we see that this has been used to insulate not only the worst parts of like civil service, but also to expand upon it. So that's also the provision. You know, when we're looking at this, it's also very localized. Like in San Antonio specifically here, we have not only had this eight year evergreen clause, you know, make this like EJ was talking about, make this negotiation process almost impossible because of the timeline, but also you have all of these disciplinary barriers Uh, protected by the contract and expanded in them. Um, And we really haven't seen the city, you know, the city laid out their issues, their five points that they want to target. um, And that doesn't even, it's it's kind of not even the full extent what we would have recommended um, starting off on. And so we, we, we're not even confident on the the strong foot that the city is starting out on. So that's just also something we'd like to, to know. My, my, oh, thanks. My, my sense is that if, uh, this gets on the ballot in May chapter 174 repeal and it passes, uh, the city will have to kind of develop a new, uh, approach to negotiating with, uh, police officers. And, uh, I'm guessing that we will likely see a meet and confer process, which the, you know, the other big cities in Texas have, um, I'm, I'm curious to get your take on how you, you feel like meet and confer might work differently. I mean, my, my sense about it um, is that uh, it, it places less of an, an obligation on the city. The city is not uh, obligated to negotiate in the same way that they would be under collective bargaining. And it might, uh, you know, EJ, you were talking about how 
you, you see things as tilted to the union. This, I, I think, maybe would would uh, move things in the other direction a little bit. Uh, how would you, is it your expectation that if this passed, that we'd have meet and confer? And what would your expectations be for that? Okay, so uh, to speak on that, if we were were to switch from the current negotiation system over to uh, the new one under Chapter One Forty Three for now, or meet and confer. Uh, what we would see is everyday citizens would have more of a, a more of a say in what happens there, right? And uh, I, I'll explain the details on how that's possible. So currently, uh, with the current negotiation system, you and I as regular citizens, we have zero say. We don't get to vote on the final contract. We don't get to go request records from the negotiation process. Under meet and confer, first of all, we would have access to uh, open record requests. So we can say, hey, okay, uh, give us all the documents and all the information that you used to come up with this contract. And then also under 143 and really under uh, meet and confer, voters would have the option to, if they choose to, uh, repeal a contract after it's been uh, signed off by city council. So city council, you know, under some sort of political duress or mm-hmm. signs a contract that they don't find that the citizens don't find appealing, we can say, "Hey, we'd like to vote on that." Similar to what Sapoa members can currently do with the current contract, and like you s- stated, meet and confer is used in other cities in almost all other major Texas cities, and in these cities, <laughs> the better pay and benefits for officers. You also see. Uh, a lower percentage of fired officers returning to the force for whatever reason. Uh, and that's under meet and confer. So with this new system, we could have strong pay and benefits for officers while protecting uh, c- citizens and keeping the police officers accountable. You know, uh, to one of the things that uh, this was uh, some, something that came up uh, during a city council uh, B session briefing a couple of weeks ago, uh, all the, the issues surrounding police reform. And one of the things that, that, that came up, and I think people who d- d- defended collective bargaining have said this, that um, if collective bargaining went away and chapter 143 civil service uh, stayed in place, that, um, you know, that, that collective bargaining at least allows for the, the possibility of creating provisions that would supersede Chapter one forty three. The the city and and the and the police union can can work out disciplinary measures that would would uh, you know would supersede those. But without collective bargaining, that we would go into it to one forty three. And um and there are some provisions in one forty three um, that have been a big problem certainly in the city. Like the 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 fact that um, you can't uh, police department can't look into disciplinary issues after more than 180 days have passed. Um, and so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, whether you would have any concerns um, about where we would stand as a city if we didn't have 174, but we were left with 143. Okay. Uh, Gilbert, I'm so glad you brought that up uh, because I was going to bring it up. It was something Good. that I noted in one of your articles and right. it's something I noted stated, like you said, by city, uh, by the city manager's office. Uh, so if one were to look into 143 and I can go ahead and pull out the actual uh, section here, 143.307. I'm not going to make you, you can look this up, but I'll give you the, the rundown. Uh, okay. It states that an agreement that is an agreement. So basically, if the city and the and Sapo were to negotiate under 143, that mm-hmm. agreement supersedes any previous statutes or laws. So whatever they in in the same way with 174, whatever they write into the the contract supersedes all other laws mm-hmm. under the new under meet and confer. Anything they write into that contract will have the same power, meaning. All anything that they've they feel they can improve on, like the 180 day rule, like maybe strengthening mm-hmm. the carb, they can yeah. still do those things. Except yeah. now the city will have more ne- more negotiating power. So it's it seems like something that would benefit the city and benefit the public, and Sapo would not lose out on their ability to uh, gain better wages and benefits for their officers. Cause as we've seen in other cities, that is not the case. James, did you want to say something? Yeah. And you know, 
obviously our next goal would be to repeal 143, right? The meet and confer system and move under a, a new meet and confer system. And, you know, kind of what we always say is, you know, accountability is non-negotiable, right? That's a, that's what we're always trying to, to push here. And that is important to remember on these kind of provisions that you just talked about, Gilbert, the 180 days, like we talked about arbitration. And right now we've seen, you know, all of these provisions expanded, not contracted under 174, under this collective bargaining rule. And we see that, you know, if you're going to be, you know, knocking away every single issue that we've put out and it's going to take, you know, two issues for every contract negotiation, you know, you're going to be at this for what, 30 years or something like that, you know? And so really, you know, you'll have the 143 system we'll be starting at, but, you know, Fix SAPD is working on repealing that as well in order to take out all of those um, protections that we see right now that are under 143. But like EJ said, you would be able to um, negotiate, you know, those provisions within 143 away under meet and confer. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's always good to remember, like our next step is to take that away. Um, as well, and to repeal it. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious if, if y'all have identified any members of council who are champions, who you consider champions for your cause. Has, has anyone stood out at this point? Oh, EJ. James, did you want to answer that? No, I mean, from from our understanding, um, at least from what we have just heard, um, is that the city council is in a position of, you know, being told by the the city attorney's office not to to take a step in any kind of positive direction because it would be in bad faith, right? That's something that we have heard um, and I think has been reported on. Um, and so current incumbent city council members are been told not to take a, not to take a stand um, or else, you know, risk bad faith, which is odd given the fact that SOPOA can endorse and financially contribute to city council members that would sign off on their contract. Um, and that's not seen as bad faith either. So um, it's, you know, we're, we don't know how the current city council members are, um, but there are also, you know, uh, non-incumbents that have been running um, a good number of them in EJ. I don't know if you want to speak on that. So the former city manager, uh, Cheryl Scully, she obviously has a lot of experience, a lot of it bad with uh, Sapoa. Have you been in touch with her at all? Like, have you, have you chatted her up or has she reached out to you in any way? I'll let James answer that. I I have not yeah, spoken. Um, I, I mean, ever since whatever her, her book came out, I mean, that's the only thing I've ever heard mm-hmm. from her or about her, I guess. Okay. Just checking. Uh, so I, I guess Brian and I can't hear each other, which is, is par for the course. Um, the... You know, what I wanted to ask about was, you know, obviously, like collective bargaining is, you know, perhaps the defining achievement of the labor movement, you know, the ability to sort of, you know, come to the table and have, you know, sort of binding talks about, about wages and benefits, uh, you know. And so I, I wanted to know how you guys sort of navigate that for Fix SAPD. Like, why is this, you know, why is it not okay for, for them to be able to, uh, I mean, do you guys think they should be able to negotiate their own their own wages and benefits? Yes. Uh, and under meet and confer, they will be able to negotiate for wages and benefits, uh, much like other cities in Texas. And if you look at the stats, Austin is the bet. They are the best paid officers in the state of Texas. Dallas is not too far behind. These are meet and confer cities. Uh, so. Under meet and confer, they will still be able to bet uh, to negotiate for wages and benefits. And w- as a group, and me personally, we are not against any sort of uh, system where workers are able to unite and negotiate for better wages and benefits. That's uh, an amazing thing, and we would not want to change that. But like James said, public safety, on the other hand, is non-negotiable. You cannot negotiate negotiate your way out of uh, abusing citizens. That's something that's non negotiable. Yeah, and other- something, John. Oh, sorry, John. Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and kind of responding to Josh there is that um, you know there are you know EJ talked about kind of the system of you know being able to have wages and benefits negotiated under meet and confer and. Something I always want to remind people is like there. I mean, there are real you know victims to the to the issues that are under this contract, right? Yeah. There are you know real people who you know the homeless man that Matthew Luckhurst tried to feed a you know a mm-hmm. crab sandwich to, 
Um, Tim Garcia, who was, you know, calling a black man the N-word and telling him how he should be saying the N-word while he was arresting him, right? Like, these officers came back and there's no justice. And so it's always really important to remember, like, if we're also going to be talking about, you know, accountability is non-negotiable, like, that's what we're referring to. Like, these people who can't even see officers lose their jobs for egregious behavior um, because, you know, now we have to negotiate over these provisions. And so, um, you know, San Antonio is one of those cities in particular that has um, really taken a lot of these provisions and um, insulated them within the contract, which makes it just that much more harder for us um, to have this conversation about accountability. So that's another reason. Now, so, separate- have you spoke- so have you spoken to other labor leaders, local labor leaders about how they feel about this push? Have you Have you gotten any sort of backing from them? So we've speak, we have spoken kind of with subsidiaries. We've talked with members of the AFL-CIO. Um, we have spoken with the ACLU, Texas. Um, and so we've reached out to them. We've had conversations. Um, you know, we don't know where they're at. I think they're still having discussions um, between themselves as an organization, and that's totally understandable. But um, we've reached out with them just to let them know kind of our position our direction and, you know, where our issues are specifically with 174 um, in San Antonio and with kind of the accountability provisions as well. Um, But we're still waiting to kind of hear back. I wanted to get a chance to ask you all, you know, this is a separate issue from the accountability issue, which is what you've been all been focusing on, but it's one that's gotten discussed a lot. And it's, I think there's been some political manipulation of the term, uh, which is, is defund the police, which, uh, you know, for some people who have advocated for it, it means simply just shifting some police resources to other areas, uh, maybe social services that would that where the, the maybe the funds could be used uh, in a better way. Um, and there's some people who maybe literally believe in 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 defunding the police. Again, that's that's not the focus of this the petition drives you've got going, but I, my sense is that you're probably going to uh, be dealing with that uh, that issue uh, politically as you go forward. Be, that you that your 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 opposition is going to is going to bring this up, and and there will be some some uh, some some fear that will be be raised about that. And so I I was just curious to get your your thoughts on on that issue and and sort of how that the the defund the police um, issue has sort of had played out in in the in our politics over the last year or so. Yeah. Um, James, I, I can hop in on this one and you can hop in on a little bit later. So this is just, this is EJ, by the way, this is my personal view. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sapoa brings up defund the police as a distraction from the issues they do not want to talk about, mm-hmm. which is the disciplinary issues within the contract as it is. And also the way the contract is negotiated. Uh, and so for us, that is our main issue. We like to talk about the 180 day rule. We like to talk about how an officer like Tim Garcia finds himself back on the force because the arbitrator states that, hey, I'm putting him back on the force because of the CBA. Uh, and that's something that we'd like to focus on. Uh, we have we've never stated anything on any other issues other than the contract and disciplinary issues. Uh, and I believe that any any other uh, topic that Sopoa tries to in- interject into the conversation is just a distraction. Uh, at the end of the day, we're focused on fixing the way we negotiate this contract and fixing the accountability issues uh, that we see in San Antonio. What's really telling is that I haven't ever seen members of Sopoa define what it means, how, how repealing 174 would lead to defunding. And I feel like that's pretty mm-hmm. telling is it's like usually like a Facebook or Twitter post, right. Is what you'll see that messaging in and you won't ever see it defined. Um, and maybe one day they will, who knows? But I think, I think that that's always very telling. Like what EJ was saying is, you know, the, they don't want to have a discussion about what even the chief of police has wanted to have a discussion about, which is the disciplinary issues within the contract and 143. Like even, you know, Chief McManus recognizes there are problems and they don't want to talk about it. They have not mentioned it. They've not talked about it. I mean, I think our work on contacting city council members about a resolution to point out the issues with the contract really helped 
you know, reveal what their thoughts were. I mean, on their back, you know, whatever their, you know, website, their pack, they actually outlined their responses to city council's position or the city manager's position on negotiation priorities. And, you know, we really feel that Fix SAPD got them to at least make a statement on it, which is that kind of, you know, call your city council member thing. And, you know, they're only willing to talk about the 180 day, it would seem. Right. And so- I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you were you were uh, you mentioned Chief McManus, and I was curious because he has certainly expressed frustration uh, over the years with the terms in the collective bargaining uh, agreement and how it's uh, sort of constrained him when it comes to dealing with disciplinary issues. Yet recently, he sounded. Um, I don't n- want to read too much into what he's saying, but he, it sounds as though he's he is uh, supportive of the concept of collective bargaining and and, and trying that again. Um, have you all been surprised or disappointed in any way by the way he has, by some of the things he said recently? No, we, well, first off, we find that he's been very consistent. I mean, if, if, if in the sense of what he finds as issues with the contract and with 143, like if you listen to that press conference, he will still mm-hmm. talk about those issues. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not disappointed. I mean, the chief is, you know, has his position. He's obviously not at the negotiating table, right? Like he right. even states right. that in the press conference. So, you know, he can be in favor of it, but, you know, he recognizes that what matters to him is the discipline process. So what really matters is if Sapoa is listening to the chief and identifying the problems because the city already has, right, those problems and expanded more so. Um, they're trying to deal with Article 2829, right? Um, but they haven't gone far enough in our opinion. And then when Sapoa laid out their you know, response to those issues, they only wanted to talk about one of the five. So it's just really... You know, the chief might be, you know, he'll have his statements, but what we see is just consistency on him knowing what the problem is and both sides not fully identifying and going after those problems in substantial ways, which is why we find that repealing is still going to be the best option. I want to give you a chance to to answer something that's come up from uh, from Sapoa's uh, incoming uh, president, Danny Diaz. He has, he has stated that during the um, petition uh, gathering process that that uh, members of fix sapd were um uh, deceiving the public in some way or, or making people think that um that they were actually uh with the police department um and that people were in some cases uh, you know signing the these petitions uh not necessarily understanding what they were they were signing what, uh, what what's your response to that Sure. Uh, my response to that is this. These, uh, as far as anyone can tell, these are unfounded claims. We never tell our volunteers or petitioners to go out and represent themselves as anything other than a petitioner for Fix SAPD. And what I would say is if he has proof of this, he should bring that proof to us. And so that so if it really did happen, we can find out who these petitioners were and discipline them. Uh, we believe in accountability for not only for the for SAPD, but also for fix SAPD. We uh, so we'd like to fix that. Uh, but as far as we can tell, he's offered no proof of this. This once again is just another distraction from talking from about the actual issues with the current negotiation process and the accountability pro- uh, problems they currently face uh, over SAPD. So, but if he has any sort of proof that any of these things happen. We would love to have him share with us and we will go ahead about fixing that. But that as far as we can tell, we have no instances of that actually happening. It's just something he said at a press conference with mm-hmm. no proof. And I um, would ask you if you all do speak to him, uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you ask him like, hey, could you offer us some proof mm-hmm. of this? It's a good question. Um, before we wrap things up, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, you know another track on which the the this the police accountability issue is is playing out, and that's at the state level. And uh, San Antonio uh, Representative uh, Barbara Gervin Hawkins recently fired filed a bill which would address the uh, 180 day rule in in Chapter 143, and would say that uh, the police would have 180 days from the moment that they discovered they became aware of the incident rather than 180 days from the, the date of the incident. And my understanding is she also has a bill that's uh, forthcoming that would deal um, 
with the issue of uh, how much power the arbitrators have. The, the police chief, uh, the arbitrators would have the uh, the power to make uh, factual determinations, but would not be able to uh, make disciplinary decisions. That The power would still be with the chief. How closely are you following what's happening at the legislature? And do you have any plans to sort of, uh, you know, uh, to, to lobby there or to, 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 to uh, advocate for the, for those issues? We've been, you know, following the legislative direction. I mean, pretty significantly, you know, we've been involved with the, um, you know, trying to, to talk with the, the members who are doing the George Floyd Act that has already been filed. Um, and, you know, we're both in the House and the Senate. And we've also been, um, you know, with Gervin Hawkins filing this new bill, we're interested to see what else mm-hmm. um, she might be interested in adding to that. Of course, we think that this is a great start, right? Like it's a great start that this is a, a direction that, um, you know, we would like to see. Um, obviously, we would love them to add more. There are, are vastly more provisions, um, you know, I'm not sure why, you know, we're making the arbitrator a fact base rather than just removing an arbitrator from the process. Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't seem to be, you know, there there doesn't seem to be any reason why not to, you know, even, you know, locally councilman courage even made the statement, you know, the buck should stop at the police chief. And if there's anything else, Mm -hmm. then it should go to the city manager. So I'm just, it's, I'm wondering why it isn't, you know, and this is something we obviously want to push is like, why isn't it going further? Um, why aren't you adding more, you know, is it an issue of, you know, how it's going to get passed or things like that. And, um, it's just, you know, we're always putting pressure to make sure that more can be included, but it's a great start. Just a a final wrapping statement. So, uh, basically the current system we have has led to San Antonio being worse than the nation for bringing back fired officers. It's ineffective and does not hold bad officers accountable. We're trying to change that uh, through the ballot. And if you would like to find out more about this, go to fixsapd.org. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, EJ Pinnock and James Dykeman, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, And we look forward to getting a chance to talk to you all again soon. Uh, For those of you all listening, I hope you all are doing well. We'll be back next week. Take care.